The film 300 is an adaptation of Frank Miller's graphic novel, but is not the first Miller novel to have been adapted for the silver screen. The Wolverine, Batman Year One, Batman The Dark Knight Returns, Elektra and Sin City are all based on Miller's work and have all attempted to mimic his graphic style. Just before we dive into the VFX, I want to quickly talk about our sponsor, Skillshare. You see, it's great to create content on your own based on your own discoveries and techniques, but when you surround yourself in a community of creatives, you'll find yourself inspired to do a lot more and take away so many new techniques. For example, Visual Don took me through some of the basics of liquids and lighting in Cinema 4D, and it was so quick and easy to understand that I got similar results in minutes. And there's so many other courses to walk you through all aspects of the VFX world, from film and video to animation, Skillshare genuinely seems like such a powerful learning tool for any VFX enthusiast, dabbler or master. Sound expensive? What if I told you you could have access to this ad-free online learning community, which is constantly launching new premium learning videos for less than $10 a month? And if you're still not convinced, the first 1,000 subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity at its fullest. And now back to the video. In most modern films, filmmakers want photorealism and for the VFX to be invisible. This requires more discipline, time and money, both in principal photography and in post-production. In 300, a certain style was required and so photorealism was not necessary, making production cheaper and quicker. For example, for blood splatter to look real, it has to be the correct amount, the correct colour and the correct texture. It has to spray in a realistic way and interact with light in a certain manner. When style when analyzing a film, these rules needn't apply. Blood splatter can be any tone and any amount. The only rule is, stay true to the style. For this scene, the actress was filmed wet for dry, meaning the actress was filmed in a water tank in front of a blue screen offset. This was done to achieve a supernatural, almost anti-gravity effect. She was shot with a high-speed camera so the director could apply certain speed ramps that the VFX then had to match. Screaming Death Monkey's VFX team were given the plates of the Oracle Girl on blue and a style frame that gave them the look and feel of how the lighting, sky and smoke should be. The smoke and the Oracle's clothes had to look and behave in a special way and interact with the Oracle's movements. The smoke was created using cloth dynamics in Lightwave. A bone chain was used to determine the location and animation of the smoke and the morph controlled how fast it was emitted from the lamps. After rendering, Ion Fusion was used for effects compositing and Fusion's grid warp tool was used to enhance and clean up the movement of the smoke. The director wanted to interpret Frank Miller's book and translate it into three dimensions. To do this, the team first identified the shots in the film they wanted to mimic from the book. These shots were dubbed Frank's frames because they helped anchor the film to Frank Miller's style and allowed for flexibility in between. A total of 10 different VFX vendors from four different countries were used, so it was incredibly important to ensure that everyone knew exactly the style the director wanted. As part of the film's visual development, the director and his team tested almost everything that would be seen in the film. From clothing and weapons, to CG wounds and blood. All this was used to create a style guide, which was then distributed to all the VFX vendors. It was in this visual development period that the director and his team came up with the idea for an effect that would give the film its final style, and they called this effect the crush. 
It consists of crushing the black content of the image and enhancing the color saturation to change the contrast of the film. In every image and every image of the film went through this post-image process. Hydrolux was tasked with creating and animating the rhino and the elephant that appear in the movie. A prop rhino was built to be used on set and Hydrolux used this rhino as a basis for their CG version. In the director's style guide, there were Photoshop style guides which were very large and very detailed and these were invaluable in allowing the team to quickly find the correct balance between real and comic book. Both animals were built and animated almost entirely in Maya and rendered using Hydrolux's separate render farm. Please give us a like if you enjoyed this video. Don't forget the links to the music used in this video are in the video description. And as always, be sure to let us know in the comments which movie VFX you'd like to see behind next.